my jar today is really um, anterior implant aesthetics in the, in the digital age. And as uh, P.O. pointed out, it's all about planning. And I think that's the common theme you see through all the different three different lectures we're going to have, where um, we do things different just because they're different patients. But the common thread is, is, is really planning and, and what it is where we're doing today. Now, the goal, they all, <clears throat> all our patients have the same goals. And that's, of course, um, developing adequate aesthetics, which is nothing else but having a harmony and continuity of heart and soft tissues, uh, uh, visible areas, and no obvious defects. You know, if patients look good, then, then they feel, feel much better. And that's, of course, uh, hard to um, achieve in, in, in some cases, but if we plan the cases adequately with today's technology, we can do this. So in order to make a point, then we're just going to run one case from A to Z, and we'll discuss the point uh, as we get along. So here we have our, our patient, Brittany, attractive 20-year-old female um, that had some orthodontics. And if you look at the braces, you think the orthodontics is finished. And once you look at the radiographs, you understand why she still has the braces and the wires to keep the teeth in place. Now, of course, we have a problem. Um, uh, obviously, a very young patient with a high lip line is about to lose the, the four anterior teeth. And emotionally, it's very difficult to deal with it. And the question now, of course, is how are we going to deal with the situation? I think we all agree, um, especially if you look at the CT scans, the cross-sections, that that's probably um, beyond any therapy to maintain these teeth. So we will be losing the teeth. The good news is, really, the roots have resorbed and the bone is mostly intact, and the question is now, how are we going to proceed? The big problem, if we lose multiple teeth next to each other and we're going to replace them with implants, of course, is we're going to have some remodeling, we're going to lose some bone peaks, and the distance um, between the base of the bone to the interproximal area that we can get around teeth, which is typically about five millimeters of tissue height, uh, around implants is maybe about three and a half millimeters. So we're going to have significantly shorter papillae, and the question is how are we going to proceed? The big problem also clinically is we have a huge range from one to seven millimeters, and the general rule is the higher the lip line, the lower the soft tissue you get between two adjacent implants. Okay? So we'll have to plan for the worst case scenario. Um, so clinically, we have to focus on what are alternative treatment options. So obviously, in this case, um, are we going to place four implants next to each other? or are we going to place two implant and do a four-unit bridge? Now, a <clears throat> two implant, four-unit bridge is very predictable. Uh, treatment modality, um, clinically, it's probably less complicated. There's a bigger room for error. However, in the long term, I think the aesthetics, even with ovate pontics, um, tissue flattens out, and, and in, in uh, 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 the very young patient population, where we can maintain tissue, that might not be the, the best treatment option. Now, if you have a flat ridge, this is probably the treatment options to go. We know that if you maintain tissue with multiple implant placement, um, and it can be uh, sequential extractions or uh, extraction at the same time in implant placement, we can achieve an adequate pink aesthetic score if we have the underlying foundation and basically just exchange the roots for, for the implants. Uh, we know about the remodeling issues, whether it's with uh, flat top implants, with an external connections, um, as described by Tarnow and Cho. We know that even platform shifted implants have some remodeling, although uh, it, it, the evidence is there that it's decreased. Um, so clearly, um, today in the partially dentalist patient, this is our treatment approach. So here we have our, our patient. Uh, in order to do the pre preparatory work, of course, we had to remove the bands, and we had to um, use some composite to hold the teeth together and some fiber to, to uh, uh, prevent them from, from extracting. Um, we'll take a cone beam CT scan, and as you can see here now, in Noble Clinician, we're able to plan this case, I think, quite <clears throat> nicely. Um, the blue teeth, the canines we're going to keep, so those are lateral extension, the red teeth, the four incisors we will be extracting. We'll do our diagnostic wax up. And you can see one of the things that happened here, of course, is that the incisal edge position of the existing teeth 
were kicked out facially by about two and a half millimeters. So the implant planning then is to the final result of, of uh, the new location of the incised ledge. And as we just talked about, if possible, I prefer a screw retained access. So the nice thing is in, in the aesthetic zone where real estate is really limited, um, we can place and plan the implants very accurately. Um, we even can place order prosthetic components at the same time that fit the anatomy. So now we kind of take out the guesswork. Uh, and if you look at it closely, the distance between the two implants, the lateral and the central, is exactly three millimeters, which means if you misplace one of the implants, you uh, basically uh, have compromised sites on the other three implants as well. So especially in the aesthetic zone, um, it is crucial to execute. Now with the new approach, where we have now a smart fusion, um, we can take a cone beam CT scan, as you can see here, and we can take an impression, both of the existing condition and of the wax up, and then using the T 2G scanner, um, we can capture the impression very accurately and then combine the two. So now we have the heart tissue and we have the soft tissue and the location of the teeth, and we can combine the two uh, by smart fusion to have a very accurate, very predictable way of planning our implants. And of course, um, we, we have the location of the, um, the final teeth, our diagnostic wax up, and then when we plan, plan on the implants, we can not only look at the, the, the heart tissue, the exact contours of the bone, but also the soft tissue. We can determine ideal coronal apical position in order to support the soft tissue, we can look at the contours of our subgingival part of the restoration of our abutments to support the tissue. And, and again, if you look at how closely these implants are placed to each other uh, because of lack of, of distance um, that's available, um, you can imagine that if you would do this surgery freehand, and I think I'm uh, an, an average talented surgeon, uh, I know right away I never could place four implants in a row that precise. So with today's technology, we actually can, can do this. Um, the software then automatically generates a tooth-supported surgical template um, that's way more accurate than those templates that were produced based on a CT scan for tooth-supported restoration, and then we can go to, to surgery. Now, before we go to surgery, if you <clears throat> want to do a provisional restoration, we can fabricate abutments and provisional restorations than before we go to surgery. So let's look at, at, at the surgery. Um, obviously, the first thing I had to do was to separate the teeth um, that we had to uh, splint together, and we just basically make an intrasulcular incision. Now, the key really here, it's a tissue reserving case. So if, if I can maintain soft tissue contours, in this case, I would be happy. That's a different approach than rebuilding the ridge, so I've got to be clear about the indication. Huh? So very easy atraumatic extraction just because there was really no root left. And there you can see the, the ideal volume and, and soft tissue contours. And this is the surgical template. Um, and the key, of course, is uh, accuracy of fit. Um, you know, this will determine the implant location, so you have to make sure that the template seats. Uh, in addition, although it's tooth supported, especially if we do multiple implants in the anterior, we secure it with a, with a uh, pin. So there's absolutely no movement possible. And then we go uh, through a, a, a drill protocol. Um, and although this is a guided surgery, that doesn't mean it's blind surgery. So each of the osteotomies, um, we prepare slightly different in terms of undersizing or tapping, depending on, on the bone quality. I'm not going to show all of the, the osteotomy steps, but it's the sequential um, drill protocol here for Noble Active um, to the predetermined length, and then we'll place the implants. Especially if you pre-tap um, like the Noble Active implant, uh, it's important that you capture the, the pre-tap, so you've got to counter-rotate your implant till it falls in, and then you pick up the same, same tap, and then you place all the implants to the pre-prescribed uh, position, as you can see here. 
there's no way that I could do this freehand. Okay? Um, and the nice thing is the planning software uh, enables you to do this and deliver it on a routine basis. Okay? So the implants have been placed, the surgical uh, template has been removed, and now um, we'll place the abutments. And in order to place the abutments, they all, of course, have a specific rotation to them. We just have to transfer the rotation that we had on our initial diagnostic cast where we fabricated our restoration. And now we just got to align the hex to what we had on the, on the model so that our restorations fit. And you can see it's, it's just you know, turning uh, a couple degree left or to the right so we can capture the exact hex location, um, as you can see here. Uh, and then we'll place our abutments and uh, our temporary restorations that have perfect margins because the laboratory fabricated. And then we'll just, um, in, in this case, we just blend them together um, for, for provisional um, strength. Uh, and uh, so we, we pick up um, with some light curing material um, the individual restoration as, as a fixed bridge, temporary fixed bridge, um, which we then seat and make sure it is uh, truly out of occlusion. Okay? So, so this is just there for aesthetics and for soft tissue support. And we'll cure our screw access hole and we will seed our restoration. This is then how the patient leaves. So all of you can do this type of surgery if you have the tools and an attention to detail. So it is, it is not difficult to do the surgery once the planning is in place and you have that obsessive compulsive um, nature that you go step by step because it's very logical. This is how the tissue then looks a couple months later. You can see we pretty much maintain all of the tissue contour. Aesthetics for the patient is no longer an option. And this is the radiograph after insertion. Um, it's probably illusional that we maintain all interproximal peaks. There will be some remodeling. We haven't figured out yet how to have a bony attachment onto um, implant components that are above the abutment implant interface. Okay? That, will, that will be the next step. If you look at the cross sections um, of the planned, planning and the delivered um, device, it's very, very accurate. Um, again, if you follow step by step, if your surgical template fits, if your diagnostic wax up was good, if your scan fit, and you merge it all together. So we can, we can deliver it. Now, there are two ways to truly restore this case. Um, we can do a cement-retained restoration, or we can do a screw-retained restoration. And, and um, Pio already talked about it. You know, the pendulum has swung. We started out 30 years ago with everything was screwed-retained. And then maybe 15 years ago, everything we could was cemented. And then we finally smartened up, and today we're back to the screw again. So we came full circle. Um, clearly, um, I, I think I'm, I'm careful when I used to cement my restorations and abutment. I always put in a cord. I cemented it. Uh, typically, I had a die express the extra cement and then seeded it. And, and I don't know how many hundreds of my own cases I flapped over the years. And I can tell you, more often than not, I found cement. So, so cementing, especially in the anterior area where you want to get some soft tissue support with your restorations, um, before we had CAD CAM uh, uh, generated uh, abutments, or e even today, it is, it is just a risk. Um, uh, therefore, I would truly like to, to do a screw retained. The bad news is about uh, um, what about the removal of the components? You know, there's, there's some uh, um, discussion out there that clearly if you take on and off components, you're going to encourage remodeling, you get epithelialization, and you're actually going to lose some bone. So they're, they're, it's, for me, it's a risk benefit, and you got to make the decision. So let me show you the two different ways how we can do it. If we decide to do a cement retained restoration, okay, we're going to use the abutments we already placed. Now the key here is you got to take an impression before you deliver the abutments. Okay? So before, at the day of the surgery, we just take the abutments, put them on our analog, and put them in some impression material you have the absolute perfect impression of your abutment. Then just set it aside the dies. Huh? Um, so you don't have to remove the components. And all you have to do is basically do now pick up impressions because you already have the die of your abutment. 
all you to pick up impression. The worst thing you probably could do is pack cord around the tissue and push it around and, uh, and introduce some foreign bodies. Okay? So what we do, um, <clears throat> here are the original abutments before they were delivered, and all we do is we do take some transfer copings. You can make them out of Duralay, you can make them out of base metal, you can cast them in gold because you can recuperate the gold afterwards. It doesn't really matter. You just need something that perfectly fits on this that you can put in the patient's mouth. Okay? Um, as you can see here, we splint it together, and then we'll just take a pickup impressions over this. So on your left of the screen, you see now those transfer copings in the impression. And all you do now is take your original uh, master dice you had from your um, from, from uh, yeah, six months ago, three months ago, secure them into the new master impression, and then you pour it up. So you have the perfect die, and today soft tissue. Okay? That's, that's how we do it. There's, there's no trauma to anything. All you do is take the temps off, put those on there, take a pickup impression, and take the die, secure them, pour up your master cast. And then you go ahead and do whatever restoration it is you want to do. You can do a uh, removable soft tissue con mask on your master cast, of course, and develop contours. So that's if you believe that leaving the abutment outweighs the, the, the risk of cement. Okay? And that's a clinical decision uh, that, that all of you have to take. The other way to do it is a screw retained restoration. The bad news is you've got to remove the components. So uh, if you go in the literature, you could have basically, theoretically, more interproximal bone loss because removing um, components may lead to that. The bad news for you and the patient is you've got to buy a new set of abutments. Noble Biocare is very happy if you use that approach because they can send you, sell you twice the amount of abutments. The good news is no cement. Okay? For me, that is an overriding issue. Also, especially in the anterior, the creation of an emergence profile where we can push tissue is much easier to not only develop but to deliver clinically if it's screw retained rather than if you, if you cement it. Okay? So if you subscribe yourself to the screw retained approach on the original master cast um, that we did prior to the surgery, which was put our transfer copings, um, put some floss to relay, um, or you know, GC resin powder, and we cut it, and we pick this up then uh, in the clinic. Okay? So we join these again in the clinic and make our master cast. And from that, we will develop new restorations that are now one-piece restorations. Now, there, there are various ways you can do it. You can bake porcelain directly to a ceramic abutment. Um, in highly aesthetic demanding cases, the way we typically do it, we do all ceramic restorations on top of the zirconia abutments and basically lube them together before we deliver it with a screw hole in the back. Okay? Because in, uh, some of the materials and optical properties of these restorations are like better than zirconia based. But as, as we get better uh, with, with the materials, um, we do that. So let's look at the different movies um, of the delivery so you can uh, Put on your funny glasses again. And uh, you're only going to run the cement movie. So we're going to run those now back to back. Okay? So here are your provisional restorations um, that we had. And you can see we maintain basically the soft tissue contour nicely throughout the, the, the restorative phase. Um, we'll take off our temporary restoration. We already took our. Um, pick up impressions. You can see now the 3D anatomy we're able to maintain. Okay? So here we have our, our crowns um, that we're now going to deliver. The only time you had to take a new impression of the die really would be if the margin was, way, um, was not in an ideal location, um, if you had some tissue recession. Right? But when you place these, you can see we have slight planching of the tissue and, and uh, basically develop the emergence profile in, in such a way that, uh, that we're able to, to achieve uh, good aesthetics. Um, and in order to really cement these restorations, I would suggest strongly to put a, a cord 
uh, gently around below the margins and then use the cement of your choice. Right? But, but I think for, for everyday uh, restoration, um, this is, this is a, a very good uh, approach, especially if you think that you can remove the cement. Okay? And if you want to stay more in traditional dentistry, um, 3D-wise, I think we maintained pretty much a lot, almost all of the volume. We lost some, uh, we'll talk about that uh, a little later, between the central and the lateral incisors. Now, if you look at the difference now to the cement-retained uh, restoration, um, you will see it, it requires a couple extra steps, but it has a lot of benefits. Okay? So, so we'll take off our temporary restoration. Now, of course, we've got to take off the abutments, and sometimes it's difficult to take out zirconia abutments. So make sure you have that little tool that actually backs out the abutments if they are not free out of the implant without fracturing them. Okay? Um, and here are our restorations. These are now screw-retained restoration. Now, the emergence profile is a little more... Um, uh, advanced in, in the screw retained restoration because we can change basically uh, the whole soft subgingival area on the restoration from the top of the implant to where the tooth comes out of the tissue. And in general, it is um, concave subgingivally and convex right at the free gingival margin. I mean, that's how we control, how we control our um, soft tissue contours. Okay? Um, so we take off the abutments, and you can see we still got a reasonable um, papilla situation. Um, soft tissue volume and contours are okay. Um, especially if you look here on the facial, we got nice three-dimensional topography. Also, if you look at the emergence profile of these restorations, it's always um, concave, convex. And as you see the restorations, you can see we are pushing the tissue to exactly where we want to have it and to have the, basically the emergence profile that we design in the lab. Now, this works well if you have osseous support. And, and of course, that is, that is the, the, the key here. So here we have now our four anterior restorations. We'll torque them down to uh, adequate torque and uh, fill our screw hole axis and have a nicely removable, um, or not a removable, a, a retrievable um, prosthesis for, for our patient. Um, you can see aesthetically it's not, a, not an issue on all ceramic restorations. And we go through our um, normal prosthetic, prosthetic options that we, that we need to, to look at. Okay. And those, of course, are now in uh, um, uh, normal occlusal concepts with, with contacts in protrusion. Uh, and in this case, we still have the canine, so we have mutually protected occlusion. Now, the key is you've got to leave some space open because we know we're going to have some remodeling now. And remember, the distance from the crest to the interproximal area is somewhere around three and a half to four millimeters I'm very happy on the acid. My outcome. It's been a long process, but I couldn't imagine having a better doctor, and I'm just so thrilled with how my teeth came out today. Yeah. So that, 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 uh, the key really is for the patient, you know, she thinks it's a long process. She doesn't know, you know what uh, Dennis would have done to her. You, you will see later. So I think she, uh, yeah, um, in California, they're slightly underworked and overpaid, I guess, um, as they say. Now, the key, I think, really is to leave yourself some space for improvement. As you looked at PO's data and the previous discussion, papilla will improve. Okay? Even if you maintain it, this is a better material. Um, the all ceramic materials are biologically better than, than the provisional material we had. So on the left, you always see at the day of delivery, you can see a little space. And then uh, over time, it will fill in. It's much better than if you close off the space. Now, what happens if you leave the space open and it doesn't fill in? Well, lucky you, if you screw retained it, it doesn't, it's not a problem. You unscrew it, you put a little low fusing porcelain on there, you put it back in. Another reason why I like screw retained restoration versus cemented. What are you gonna do if it's cemented? Um, now you can just hope that the patient really doesn't, doesn't mind too, too much. Um, for for uh, 
Uh, and we can see this on one side and the other side, and it fills in for, for an aesthetic result. And that, of course, improves time over time. So every year or every six months this year back, it looks better than before. And it takes up to about three years for this whole complex to, to fill up and become aesthetically stable. But you can see, just look at the stippling of the tissue, and, and uh, we have one happy patient. Now, if you look at the radiographs, and this is now at 18 months, Okay. Between the two central incisors, it's relatively easy to maintain the bone. There are two, two things you've got to consider. It is um, the spot where the two distant, you know, the implants are further apart than between the central and the lateral. And the bone density on the peak is a little different. Between the lateral and the central, this is typically where the crucial area is. You can see we're still way above the uh, abutment implant interface. Uh, if you look at the horizontal offset the remodeling for biologic width, it's very narrow. Um, there is no crate around the implant. It basically goes from the top uh, up. So, so I think um, having that approach allows us to develop um, the best aesthetics that we can today. Um, can we do better? Not until somebody invents cementum on an abutment where we actually have the attachments of the sharpest fibers that gives us the, the five millimeters instead of the three and a half millimeters. So that is, that is where, where we are right now uh, with our thing. So if you look at the biology, if you look at multiple adjacent implants, um, it's always an issue of heart tissue. Do you have enough heart tissue? Because if you don't have enough heart tissue, then we don't have to talk about papilla. It's, it's going to be a, a problem. Um, clearly, you need soft tissue, both adequate amount and you got to have thick tissue. And if you don't have thick tissue, you got to do connective tissue grafting to further improve that. And then there are biologic issues in terms of biologic worth. Um, there's going to be some remodeling. I think clearly and partially dentalist patients, um, you want to go to a platform shift implant with an internal conical seal. And you have to understand that today there are limitations that unless you have sharpest fibers, you only will get on the average about three and a half millimeters of tissue between two adjacent structures. Um, everything else is, is luck. If you look at the technology aspect of it, um, I think it's never been easier to deliver excellent surgical placement. Um, the, the, uh, the planning, I think, uh, allows you to select the best size implants, with the best distances, you know how close you can get to adjacent tooth. You know how close you can get the implants together. We're still getting good outcome. And, and if you looked at the planning pictures, I think you clearly saw that within the four teeth between canine and canine, we had about 0.2 millimeters of extra space. And, and if you think that you can place four implants freehand to that level of precision, you maybe should go to Vegas because you might get luckier there. Um, uh, I cannot do it. Uh, we used to, you know, we, you know, if you look back, 10 years ago, we tried to do it, and uh, we never were able to deliver to that level of care. So I think clearly today it's, it's, it's a great thing. With a smart fusion, um, it's, it's, it's great because an accelerated protocol, we only have to take one cone beam. In the flow of the clinic, of course, it's nice because we take it at the first visit, typically when the patient comes in. And based on that, we can develop the whole treatment plan. We don't have to rescan the patient again with, with a, um, a, you know, a, a radiographic template or jig. We can do everything now on casts, develop our wax up, and then take the cast and scan the cast, and then fuse the cast, the soft tissue contour, and the diagnostic wax up to the original bone scan. Okay, so the patient doesn't have to come back. Uh, we have less radiation exposure. We have a better fitting surgical template because we make it off a cast. And, and the teeth are really the reference points. And, and of course, a scan of a cast and making a template there is, is much more accurate clinically in seeding than have the same template based on a CB cone beam scan. Um, and uh, um, I, I think having reliable soft tissue contours on your scan allows you to place your implants 
especially coronal apically in depth of implant placement, development of your contours, much more accurate than we could uh, uh, before in these partially edentulous patients. So with this, I want to thank uh, all of you for your kind attention, and hopefully there is some exciting news ahead for all of you uh, for the uh, coming months uh, with Noble Bike here. Thank you.